greetings to all of you, dear brothers and sisters, and my dear friends. I hope that all is well with all of you. And every time you listen to Forgiveness, a Lenten study, I hope that shows you so many things, so giving you experiences in your own personal life. And that you give yourself the opportunity, if it's possible, to come in a group or find time when you do your session that I also offer in this meditation to take your personal time with your beloved spouse, Jesus. So this study ends in this last part of chapter 6. And after this part 2, I'm also going to bring in the session 6. And that is the end of the forgiveness, a Lenten study. But it's not the end of our studies and meditations. You can use whatever you need to use in all that I was given to all of you. You can download from Spreaker. Whatever you do, you can listen through Facebook. The most important thing is that it's doing something with your soul, with your life. My dear ones, you are so important in God's eyes. So important. And I want to encourage you to hold on to our beloved spouse, Jesus. And he is worthy to be praised and worshipped in every part and every movement that we undertake in our life. Let us pray first. Heavenly Father, we come to you with all that we are, with all that is in us. And we longing to become more aware who you truly and really are. But sometimes we cannot hold on to what all those beautiful things are coming from you. Things happen in our daily times and, and also because of the businessness of our life. We lose track. We don't give ourselves the time to become in a quiet place. And that can happen with so many other things. Holy Spirit, refresh us. Come deep inside of us and make more indwelling. We need your wisdom and knowledge. We need insight, forgiveness, also sometimes difficult for us to receive the forgiveness from God, and help us that our heart will become a heart of forgiveness if a person comes to us or if we have to go to another, that we have an apology, that it comes right from our heart, and give forgiveness if we have to give forgiveness, 
and help us to listen. When we need to listen, when a person stands before us with his or her apology or the story where we went wrong and hurt, we ask that through Christ. Amen. Rethinking the nature of justice. When we reverse the conventional relationship between repentance and forgiveness from repentance yielding forgiveness to forgiveness yielding repentance, what happens to our understanding of justice? It may seem that justice, as we have traditionally understood it, has no place in this new arrangement. Yet there are two basic understandings of justice to consider as we grapple with this important question. Retributive justice and restorative justice. Retributive justice is by far the better known and is the norm in societies shaped by Western civilizations. Our legal systems depend on an understanding of justice as punishment for the offender. The way to balance the scales of justice according to this norm is to impose penalties against the guilty. Punishments from community serves to prison to execution. We sometimes call this the penal system, reflecting or assumption that penalties are the proper way to achieve justice and give the victims satisfaction. Our sense of fairness tends to be satisfied to a certain extent by this form of justice. People should have pay for their transgressions and this involves suffering a loss of freedom if not one's life. Restorative justice is more often the norm among the world's tribal people. The value of communities and the desire to restore an offender to a sense of kinship with that person's community results in a very different approach to justice. For example, in New Zealand among the Maori, four elements inform their approach to modern-day teenage crime. First, the form of accountability requires for these young people is to be found by consensus involving the whole community. Second, the desired outcome is reconciliation rather than isolation and punishment of the offender. Third, the focus is less on blaming one individual than exploring the wider causes of wrongdoing. Fourth, Concern for restoring harmony in the community is greater than concern for breach of the law. In general, indigenous societies see misbehavior as a distortion of communal harmony that calls 
for good teaching and healing. In some cases, this might involve revealing publicly the offenses within the offender's community. For the offender, this means the humiliation for facing daily those who know him or her best. However, the purpose is not to humiliate the person, but to expose the negative behavior. The community affirms the worth and value of the offender and encourages that person to reform, but it shames the misbehavior. In other cases, it might mean removing offenders from a stagnant TV-centered environment and placing them in a certain kind of isolation, not incarceration, where they have no choice but to reflect inwardly. The purpose here is to teach individuals of their weakness alone and their dependence on the good of the whole community, in which they too have responsibilities to uphold the peace. Mediation and community councils are the primary means of practicing such restorative justice. What finally is the purpose of justice? Is punishment the goal or restoration of a fully human life. God is far more interested in making new beginnings than in satisfying panel codes. God exercises judgment in the service of salvation and grants mercy in hopes of reclaiming us from the sad spectacle of our sin and its consequences. God has designed for a future radiant with renewal harmony and peace and invite us to embrace the vision. The beauty of this vision is what the cross of Christ opens to all humanity if we will accept it. And what about us? To forgive is to say yes to God's future creating a path into that bright hope by the grace of the Spirit. May we find freedom to do so gladly. Now together we're going to do session six, beginning again. Let us pray. Great God, your ways are truly not our ways, and your thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. Help us to grasp the nature of of your justice within the wider realm of your mercy. Just as your ocean of love washes over the ocean of our sin. Reveal to us what we need to see within our own minds and hearts and lead us in your ways of life renewing truth and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's do some exploring. 
direct attention to how this final chapter begins with a section on the relationship between forgiveness and reconciliation. It suggests that reconciliation can occur without direct forgiveness, but that a certain interior release of the past must be in place for reconciliation to be authentic. The chapter speaks of implied forgiveness and offers a few stories to illustrate. Ask participants if they can think of stories from their own experiences with families and friends or colleagues that illustrates reconciliation without direct forgiveness. Invite a brief sharing of a story and ask the storyteller if she or he thinks the situation involves a truly forgiving heart or just sweeping things under the rug. And discuss how we might know the difference. Point the group to this statement in the chapter. The only problem with our conventional ideas about justice is the larger witness of Jesus' life and death. The next several paragraphs points the story in the Gospels that seems to argue that repentance is not a pre-requested to forgiveness for God. It's a pre-requisite. Excuse me. Read another beloved gospel story. Not address it in the chapter that may also be read in this light of John 8, chapter 8, I mean the verses 1 to 11. The account of the woman caught in adultery. Discuss where repentance and forgiveness are found in this story. And what is Jesus expressing of forgiveness here? Where is the element of repentance? And notice that Jesus' refusal to condemn this woman is an implicit expression of forgiveness and that this exhortation to her, go your way and from now on do not sin again is an implicit expectation of her subsequent repentance. Discuss any connections people see between the woman caught in adultery and the murderer of the Dakota Sioux. The Dakota Sioux man from the story you're counting on chapter 1. What justice does each sinner face? How is release from the death sentence likely to affect them? And discuss the distinction between retributive justice and restorative, restorated justice in the chapter. And look at two paragraphs in rethinking the nature of justice. So you have to go back on our meditation study. What is most convincing or promising about the idea of restorative restorative justice? And what anxieties do people have about its limitations? So responding. Have participants journal about one question below and ask them to work on the other questions during the week. First, what relationship do I see between the emotions I must struggle with around forgiveness and my ideas of what serves justice. Another question, how do I respond inwardly to retributive justice? 
to restorative justice? Where do I stand on the relative value of each and how would I justify my stance biblically and theologically? Another question. How does restorative justice connect with the idea that forgiveness involves us in larger issues of human community? Remember that from our first chapter? And then you come to a closing activity. You can sing a song. You can sing the song, Joyful, Joyful, We Rejoice. We adore thee, and an expression of gratitude and praise for God's great mercy and grace. If your hymnal includes the verse, Thou art giving and forgiving, sing this as well, or find your song. Remind the group that the water bowl, signifying God's grace and the stones, Symbolize persons yet unforgiven in our lives is near the door. If any are ready to slip another stone into the water, they are free to express their act of forgiveness before leaving. And the class by sharing signs of Christ's peace with each other. My dear ones, I cannot say it enough. Do something with it. Do something with your life. It's excited when things change, when life situations becoming in restoration coming healed open your heart for forgiveness but also to receive forgiveness don't block yourself and don't block others and again I say this is not from my sight with judgmental words but only with love so this is the end of But I, if I may say so, this is just a start. Without life, in new experiences, how we deal with forgiveness to give and to receive, what it's going to do with our life. May the Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May you have peace within. So looking forward to go with you in another meditation or study. It is so amazing, wonderful to feel the bound that the Spirit is allowing us to have that. As Christians, as brothers and sisters, we are connected. We are bound in the Spirit. May you be blessed in so many ways. I love you guys. So, you will hear from me more, okay? This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.